Okay, so welcome back everyone for uh, the first panel of the day focused on uh, groundwater resources. Um, so it's good that uh, we had uh, Chandra introduce a little bit the, the subject before. Um, as he was saying, uh, you know, groundwater is taking an increasing role in irrigation because uh, surface water supplies are becoming scarce and uncertain. So it's going to be something uh, even more critical in the future. You know, just, just, just a few facts about groundwater currently. Ground, groundwater accounts for about 40% of all irrigation water. And in some, uh, in some uh, highly water stressed area, areas, sorry, like China, uh, groundwater is used to grow about two thirds of grain crops. So it's, it's really a very important resource. Um, Groundwater supplies are by, by far much more significant than surface water supplies by a, factor of, by a factor of hundreds. It's a resource that we need to consider, to think about, and to know how to manage uh, is this, yeah. um, in order to use it uh, efficiently uh, for agriculture. So to talk about these subjects, um, we have our uh, four, four panelists here. Uh, Timothy Griffin, uh, director of the Agriculture, Food and Environment program at Tufts University. Uh, Giovanni Piscini, um, uh, um, sorry, um, <laughs> from the uh, Global Production Sustainability Lead at Monsanto Company. Lisa Dal uh, Lise, sorry, Dalbauman, uh, adjunct professor at Northwestern and founder of Integrated Water Stewardship. And Dennis McLaughlin, a professor of hydrology from the uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at MIT. So now I'm uh, giving, the, giving uh, each of them uh, a few minutes to introduce themselves. Tim? Very good. <clears throat> thanks, Alex, and thanks for inviting me. I've done uh, one or two of these before. It's really a great program. So I'm Tim Griffin. I am at Tufts University. Um, I, I direct a program called Agriculture, Food, and Environment, which is about as broad in scope as you might guess with a name like that. Uh, we're very interested in uh, not only the agricultural part, but as was noted earlier, the linkages between agriculture and nutrition and the availability of different kinds of foods and the choices that consumers make around food. Um, I'm a, a bit of an outlier for Boston academics. I'm an agronomist and soil scientist by training. Um, so worked, did a lot of field work, uh, some irrigated agriculture, some not, but even how do we better use water that falls from the sky, so how do we store water in soils, those kinds of things. Um, and also spent a lot of time working directly with farmers and ranchers. Uh, most of my experience, not quite all, but most of it is domestic, so it focuses on the U.S., and I'll touch on that at various points as we go along this morning. And also that at, at, uh, at some level, uh, as we heard this morning, we're talking about uh, globally hundreds of millions of smallholder farms. Uh, of course, larger farms in the US, but still a lot of uh, smallish family owned farms. And that to be able to manage any of these water sources, soil water, groundwater, surface water, the decisions get made at that level eventually. So even just the challenges of um, providing uh, different kinds of information and availability of infrastructure and technology is a gigantic challenge. And then, of course, groundwater compared to surface water is a bit out of sight, out of mind, because we don't see it. We pump it and then use it. So uh, lots of challenges and opportunities, and look forward to talking to all of you this morning. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Giovanni Piccini. I'm with Monsanto Company, and I lead the Global Production Sustainability Group. Uh, we have an opportunity at um, Monsanto to improve our water application efficiency globally. And as such, we actually made a commitment to the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, where uh, we will increase our water application efficiency by 25% by the year 2020 globally in our entire seed production footprint. So uh, it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to work with a team of folks that uh, really are determined and uh, dedicated to improve water practices, not only by introducing new technologies in areas where the techno technology is not available, as well to educate our growers and our farmers and our customers in better use of water resources to ultimately increase their profit. 
Um, so I've been with Monsanto now for nine years, and uh, prior to leading the Global Production Sustainability Group, I was uh, uh, in uh, biotechnology when I worked on uh, um, uh, the product that is known as DraftGuard, uh, so our uh, product that is drought resistant. And then uh, prior to that, I was a faculty at Texas A&M University working on water conservation, uh, irrigation management, and um, understanding crop water use, primarily focusing on sustainable cropping systems, whereby uh, we try to identify the better cropping system for maximum, instead of looking at maximum yield, we are looking at maximum productivity from the same point of profit for the grower. Often, uh, the highest profit doesn't come from the maximum yield. So how can a grower really can uh, um, evaluate the value of each inch of water that he applied to his crop? Um, so I spent about 14 years as a faculty at Texas A&M, and uh, prior to that I was University of California, and I graduated from the University of Bari in Italy. That's where I'm originally from, uh, from with uh, uh, a PhD in crop physiology. Thank you, Lise. Uh, good morning, I'm also very excited to be here. I thank Ivana for basically doing a, a cold LinkedIn call to invite me, <laughs> so thank you. I, this is one of the best LinkedIn contacts I've ever gotten, I think. Um, I'm Lise Saul Bauman. I am, as you see, the founder of Integrated Water Stewardship, LLC, and the idea behind integrated means how do we find solutions that are good for all the interested parties, which means the community, the government, business, and the environment. And those aren't all always taken into account as they should be. Um, I founded IWS LLC about two years ago. Before that, um, oh, well, first of all, I'm a chemical engineer by training. And I often say when I'm teaching class, I have never in my life worked with a distillation column. And those of you that are chemies in the audience are going <laughs> to get that joke, and probably no one else will. Um, <laughs> Um, I spent uh, 10 years at PepsiCo, including eight years as director for water stewardship for global operations. And my elevator speech about that used to be that I, uh, I worry about and try to solve our water problems, our water worries around the world. I worry about it, and I try to solve them. So that started out looking at in plant, how do we get as water efficient as we can in plant? And then, of course, we have to look outward as well. In what context is that plant operating? And beyond the plant, in what context are the pieces of the supply chain operating? And they may be far away, and you may not have good insight into them, and how do you deal with that? And one of the challenges is the same answer doesn't work everywhere. And anyone who's worked with big companies know big companies like to solve, to, to solve the problem once. And water, as all of you know, is very context-driven, and so that makes the, the cookie-cutter approach difficult. So this is kind of where the seed of integrated water stewardship came from. How do we figure out in a specific place at a specific time how to, how to solve the water challenges to the benefit of all players? And I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion this morning. Dennis? OK, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Alex, for your invitation. I um, am a hydrologist on the faculty of the Civil Engineering Department at MIT. and. Um, I also have a background in control engineering. Most, much of my training is in that area. So I'm kind of interested in the um, uh, marriage of those two disciplines, and in particular, ways that we can apply ideas from control engineering to water <coughs> issues. And one of the things in, in control that is quite relevant is the idea of adapting continuously in real time to change, and also change that comes from uncertainty in for example, climate change was mentioned earlier, but even without climate change, we have a lot of uncertainty in agriculture, and particularly in the use of water and um, the way that water might affect uh, cropping. So um, one of the things we're doing in my group is to try to understand how um, adaptive control and management can be applied in uh, <coughs> sort of strategic ways in the water sector. So one obvious way is um, to use more uh, <coughs> smart control in irrigation management at the field scale. But there's also another dimension that's more strategic, and to think about, are we really growing crops in the right place? And especially given the large uh, variability <coughs> in the distribution mm -hmm. of water globally, and if we were growing crops differently, how would we get those crops to the people who need them? And um, uh, that's, of course, connected in a way to this 
idea of virtual water and the footprint of water that we'll hear about more in this meeting. So um, I think there are a lot of potential, there's a lot of potential to use um, optimization and um, techniques from other disciplines in engineering in the water sector. <clears throat> and so um, to bridge, uh, say, engineering and management uh, in uh, this, especially uh, with respect to groundwater. So I hope we get to talk more about that. So thanks all for, for your introductions. <clears throat> so to, to begin this panel, um, uh, we thought it would be a good idea maybe to bring everybody up to date on the subject of, of, of groundwater and give a quick overview of uh, how this resource is used uh, through a, a few case examples. So I'm, 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 I'm going to give the the word to, to the panel to talk a little bit about this. You know, where is groundwater used? Uh, where is it well managed, badly managed? How is it used? What is it, uh, what is it um, used for? And what general problems are people faced with in terms of, of, of groundwater? Tim, you go first? Sure. Go ahead? So I'll, I'll talk about a couple of uh, regions of the US that use primarily groundwater for irrigation, not exclusively. Um, but, but first, just to, the idea of, and this came up in the, in the keynotes, that um, irrigation plays different roles depending on where you are. So here in the Northeast, you could have a vegetable grower that might use an irrigation system only two or three years out of 10. Uh, so they're just supplementing it, but it's high value crops. <laughs> they're basically protecting productivity. Compare that to growing leafy greens in Yuma, Arizona, uh, where the entire water budget of the crop is met by irrigation. Could be surface water, and in some cases, um, groundwater. Groundwater use in the United States, it does vary. The, uh, the High Plains Aquifer came up this morning, which underlies most, almost the entire state of Nebraska, um, but goes as far south as uh, the Texas Panhandle. Uh, and varies quite a bit. Those are different climatic zones, different recharge rates, all of those kinds of things. Um, but a lot of irrigation in those areas. Nebraska irrigates more acreage than any state in the US, more than California. So uh, <clears throat> versus a place, you know, we all, we saw some graphics this morning about California and uh, particularly the Central Valley, which is historically has been large infrastructure conveyance of surface water, but particularly during the last seven years, the four and a half, five year drought there, a, a huge development and exploitation of groundwater resources in the Central Valley. Um, so they're using groundwater to supplement uh, surface water for irrigation. A lot of it for high value crops that are used for food, but not all, there's still a lot of cotton, a lot of alfalfa. Uh, places like Salinas that grow a lot of leafy greens, but a huge proportion of the strawberries of the US, the Salinas Valley depends almost entirely on groundwater. In terms of where problems arise, so place like Salinas, th one of their problems is less about the availability of water, as a, and they have significant issues with contamination of groundwater, um, primarily from nitrogen, primarily from agriculture. Within the High Plains Aquifer, you have Nebraska, which is relatively stable. Uh, the aquifer there, even though they're uh, irrigating somewhere around nine or 10 million acres. Um, if you go to the southern part of that, which is under a different kind of climate and hydrology, it's also under a different, uh, a significantly different, in parentheses, less governance. Um, and I warned one of my doctoral students, Greg. Greg, raise your hand. Greg is uh, doing his work on, uh, part of it is how differences in governance in the High Plains Aquifer, so Nebraska has a very innovative system and Texas has essentially no real way to govern the use of groundwater uh, that's used for irrigation. So it's, uh, it's, it's partly about the physical system in which that production is taking place and it's partly the governance system that is kind of overlaying that. Um, so the, the problems are not the same. You go to some coastal regions that use groundwater and excessive extraction is increasing the rate of saltwater intrusion, things like that. So again, it tends to be quite um, specific to uh, geography, geology, hydrology, and climate. And overlay on top of that the differences in crops in those regions. Okay. Okay. So, 
Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to tie this a little bit to the to some of the comments that were made this morning from our speaker. Um, you know, uh, we're going to have to increase our uh, food production, right? Of food um, availability in the next you know, 20, 30 years. So we're almost going to have to double our production to maintain um, the need for food that, uh, from an increasing population. So how does the industry position itself in order to meet the demand while at the same time maintaining water resources? And uh, so today, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really challenging uh, because most of the time uh, our food production, especially from a seed production standpoint, let's talk about maize, for example, which is our staple crop, um, you know, it's it's done in area where uh, with sensitive aquifers. You know, we, we in North America we grow in the uh, Ogallala Aquifer, running from all the way from uh, the Dakotas down to Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas. And as you say, Tim, you know the, the dynamics are different for uh, for water conservation and for production. We need to get the water out of the aquifer. We need to get the production going. We need to maintain sustainable. Um, productivity, while at the same time we need to save the environment, we need to save the water resources. And so today our major effort has been trying to optimize every single drop of the water that we put on our, in, our seed production, um, in our seed production footprint. So uh, it's not an easy task, right, because that changes, uh, it, we're talking about not only us using the grower, but how do we educate our growers? How do we uh, let our grower realize that there is a lot more that can be achieved by using less natural resources? Uh, and that's just not a problem in North America. We see that everywhere. Um, water in most cases represents a cost. Uh, for growers. So how do we really work with our growers so that they can have a cost saving but at the same time maintaining productivity? And so we've been focusing really a lot in trying to uh, balance the need for water while at the same time you know, educating the grower uh, by introducing new technology but also introducing a new way uh, to, uh, to really use our um, resources. Uh, we heard this morning about some of the irrigation efficiencies uh, in uh, um, our surf surface water uh, delivery system, 35%, right? Which means a lot of that water is not really going to the crop. That water has been wasted, you know. Now, in some cases, you can argue that maybe they might be recharging some of the aquifers, and therefore, there is a recycling of that water, so it's not a complete loss when we think about the overall efficiency. But definitely, we have an opportunity for improvement. This concept of, uh, you know, this morning we heard about delivering uh, you know, uh, based on a calendar schedule, uh, it's obsolete, right? If uh, uh, today the biggest opportunity, in my opinion, is, uh, um, you know, educating the grower, not in terms of how much water to apply, but when to apply the water. Apply water, you know, just because it's available that particular day of the week, you know, not often lead to the better water, to the greatest water conservation and water use efficiency. So, you know, the, the the other concept we were talking about is uh, this concept of, uh, um, you know, growing crops in areas that are less, perhaps, you know, sensitive to the um, to the changing level of the aquifers. Uh, that, of course, comes with uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, government policies and state policies, right? Think about the impact that uh, we will have if we had to move, say, almond production. I was talking about this morning, you know, almond production from California to another area that is uh, perhaps less sensitive to uh, uh, water restriction or to drought. So um, I think we have a long way to go. I think there is an opportunity here for the public and private sector to partner to really change the way we use water resources, to really protect our aquifer, and to really at the same time achieve our ultimate goal, which is to provide uh, you know, a, a sustainable, um, sustainable food uh, and increase our um, uh, the overall uh, need for food uh, in the next you know 20 30 years. Okay, uh, thanks for this very good and broad overview. A lot of subjects that we'll be uh, talking about more deeply here. Maybe uh, so one one last comment about a, a few case examples on the um, on the use of groundwater. So at, at least in the U.S., typically food and beverage companies buy water from the local utility. Not always, but often. And that means they have no control over where they're getting. I mean, if you're in a city or a, a, a district that's using groundwater, that the, where the utility's pulling groundwater, that's what you're using. If you're in a place that's pulling, or if your utility's pulling surface water, that's what you're using. You have no say over it. Sometimes it's a blend. So it's, it's more difficult for, for, pro, for manufacturing entities of any type to really control that, because they are not the ones pulling the water. 
Um, they need to save water regardless. They, they are certainly cognizant of what's happening as their rates go up and down. And rates don't necessarily always track with scarcity. California, they do. Some parts of the country, they don't. So I would say that from the manufacturing standpoint, it's a much more reactive than proactive position. Certainly in the supply chain, uh, I won't actually dive into this because Tim's actually done a really good job already of talking about the, the farm aspect of it. So I think that it's where, where is an entity sitting in terms of are you pulling the water yourself? Are you buying water from someone else? And of course, in other parts of the world, the story looks very different than it does in the US. Mm -hmm. I'd just um, maybe like to say a few words about the nature of the groundwater resource, which is quite what's quite distinctive about it. Um, as uh, it's kind of been uh, implied earlier, groundwater is a huge resource, but you could look at it as a very large reservoir that has a very, almost a trickle of throughput of uh, inflow. And it's because if you look at the water budget, global water budget, the large fluxes are the fluxes that go in and out of the atmosphere, the precip precipitation and evaporation. The recharge to groundwater is very small. But the, re the reserve, the asset, is very large. So if you, you think of it as a bank uh, with an asset that's huge, but very little replenishment. Um, so you can't draw out of the asset um, sus sustainably for a long time at a larger rate than what comes in. It's a traditional concept called safe yield. But there are other things you can use a very large asset for, and that's you can use it as a buffer for change. So if you have a very dry year, you, can, you have this large asset of groundwater that's much larger than the water stored in the atmosphere or even than the water stored in surface reservoirs. So you can draw on that asset, take water out, more water than comes in, and deal with your hopefully short-term drought situation. But the implication is you have to replenish the asset later. And interestingly, for example, to take California, uh, in dry periods, groundwater withdrawals do go down, but they don't go up proportionately in wet periods. So uh, in a wet period, it's more likely historically for agriculture to expand oh, we have more water, and we saved water earlier, so we've got new water, let's um, expand. For example, the grapes along the side of the San Joaquin Valley going up the, the foothills. Um, but of course, it only works if you can somehow institutionalize the concept of replenishing the asset. And um, that's where, of course, the, the more social, political, economic things come in to play. Uh, Murray Darling was mentioned. Um, that's an interesting example of a very effective water market, which we, we'd like to study. But it's primarily in surface water. And Murray Darling also has groundwater issues. Um, one last thing about the nature of the groundwater resource that I think Murray Darling is an example of, as is California, as is almost anywhere. Um, groundwater is tended to use, be used, um, extracted, more in semi-arid regions where rain-fed agriculture which we should remember is still the largest uh, contributor of water to agriculture. Um, so what happens in a semi-arid area when you withdraw groundwater and you try to be very efficient is you have a problem of accumulating salt. And we, we need to consider that when we talk about efficiency in groundwater. Um, because there can be a situation where you've increased efficiency dramatically, but you've also increased salinity and therefore uh, maybe just decrease yield or maybe even make it very difficult to grow crops at all. And this has happened for thousands of years in human history. We, we all know examples of, say, Mesopotamia. And it's a problem in the Indus, what the Chandra talked about, too. So there's a balance in understanding the resource between pushing for efficiency and also making sure that the resource is sustainable. So I, I think. Um, the, that's what makes the policy options not quite so easy. Because if it was really all just about efficiency, then, and it's in fact profitable, why haven't we done it more in the past? The wedge uh, paper that was mentioned earlier also talks for each wedge, Chandra I think mentioned it, uh, not only how it can help, but also the problems of increasing productivity and accumulating more nutrients, increasing efficiency, accumulating salt. 
so it takes, that's one of the reasons I agree that uh, this is a good time to work in this field because it's going to take some new expertise and some new ways of looking at how we can, especially in groundwater, manage this rather distinctive resource that is not the same as some of our other water resources. So uh, building on that, so several of you mentioned issues of uh, efficiency, how, how to use groundwater efficiently, how to use it sustainably. We've seen, uh, I think we, we've made, made the case now uh, of how important this, this resource is, uh, but it's also a hidden resource. Uh, and its, its use depends on local conditions. The, the conditions in Nebraska or in the Texas Panhandle or in California are very different. Then what does it, uh, what does, what does it mean to use groundwater sustainably? So what, what is the, you know, how would you define uh, a sustainable use of groundwater? Should we, should we go for efficiency? Should we go for profit? How does it depend on the region? Um, questions, uh, I think, I, yeah. Um, I think you, we also mentioned, um, uh, well, we didn't mention, you mentioned the Giovanni uh, issues of, uh, of uh, water efficient crops. Yep. Uh, that could be, uh, that could also play a role here. So I guess, you know, from my perspective, ideally, we would wanted to use groundwater resources that the amount that we use should be related to the rate of recharge, right? That would be in the perfect world. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, that doesn't happen every year like that. You know, we go through cyclical uh, droughts. Hence, you know, we tend to pump more water than the recharge that uh, occur, you know, in the years uh, post drought. Uh, we see now, you know, uh, more and more of these uh, high drought events that uh, are creating situation that is leading uh, to um, higher use of groundwater resources. And, you know, it's hidden, right? We can't really see it. So today, I think uh, in the private and public sector, we are seeing a lot of uh, new information finally that is really available to us to really understand the rate of depletion. And so how do we react to that? Um, so, you know, to me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of everything, you know. It's a little bit in terms of uh, um, understanding, first of all, the application efficiency. How efficiently we are going to have to take water to produce a crop in those areas where we don't have enough rainfall. So in order to do so, how efficient can we be when we apply that water? Can we get to a point where it's going to be 100%, meaning that every 10 millimeters, 10 millimeters will be used by the crop? They're never going to get there, right? There are going to be some inheriting losses due to the engineering system, to, to the you know soil, and so on and so forth. Now, when we lose water into the soil, again, you know that kind of recharges the aquifer. But um, the industry, the 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 the, the, um, uh, the irrigation industry, is really doing a lot of effort today in really maximizing the um, the, the water application efficiency, in, which in return will limit the amount of water that we pump from aquifers. Uh, we mentioned briefly this morning about variable rate irrigation of water, right? Uh, why apply water in parts of the field that do not have the maximum productivity? Why not concentrate in those parts of, part of the field where we have maximum productivity? That technology is there, right? It's available. The largest uh, irrigation company in the world, Valley, Lindsay, you know, they have all this system. They're pricey, so there is always a balance, right? Or how we're going to balance the introduction of new technology with the cost of commodities that today specifically, you know, is very low. So we can incentivize that. We can work with farmers. We can uh, try to support that. At the same time, you know, timing of irrigation, of course, is important. Uh, there is another huge um, value, in my opinion, that uh, we need to consider is the introduction of drought-tolerant crop or, uh, you know, more water-efficient crops, you know. And uh, today, the industry, as well as the, the public sector, is really working towards um, the in, uh, introduction of technology within crops that are allowed to conserve water. Um, and so to me, you know, it's a, it's a coordinated approach. And uh, uh, being able to uh, put it all together you know, will really help us better uh, sustain uh, our aquifers. And it's, it's, it's not so much about the the efficiency of the drop that you apply uh, with the crop that you're growing right now, but also uh, choosing the right crop to be to be growing in in the place, depending on where you are, or maybe you wouldn't even want to grow crops at all. Maybe you would want to grow fuel or or or, or cattle feed, cattle feed. Sorry. I mean, you can you can look at this over different time frames. So the 
the example you raised, Giovanni, about uh, making decisions about exactly when should we apply how much water is a relatively short-term decision. It takes place within a single production season. And, and it, you might be heavily reliant on irrigation, or you might be only partially reliant on irrigation. But So there's, the, there's that gain in efficiency that maybe is best combined with the crop gain in efficiency, as you were talking about. Then there are these other timescales about could, uh, could you provide incentives to grow uh, either different crops in a particular location or the same crop somewhere else because it makes more sense in terms of not only water resources, but the other major categories of resources, land, uh, you know, the things we actually that go into the growing, but it also takes all of the other input and output pieces of those supply chains. So th those I view on a time scale of it's probably decades to be able to do that. And we see examples of that certainly in the United States where you know, there used to be n no production of a particular crop. So if you go back maybe to the late 1940s, there was no production of potatoes in Idaho, which now we all think of Idaho potatoes as kind of a brand, yeah. and which relied on the development of surface water irrigation. But it takes a long time to do that. So we can, in places that are moderately water stressed and we're using groundwater, I think we can make some really good progress focusing uh, early attention on the efficiency <laughs> side. Where it's severe groundwater stress, th then you're looking at a little bit more catastrophic situation. And the example, within the High Plains Aquifer that I would point to is kind of the conversation that's going on in Western Kansas, which is it's dropping f quickly enough that the conversation goes something like this. Should we just keep pumping it until it's entirely dry? Or should we moderate it? Or should we qu quit growing what's there? But if you quit growing what's there, that entire economy is sitting depending on the production of that crop or set of crops. Um, so th that's a very different situation than some place that has relatively stable aquifer levels. That we can probably mitigate a little bit through efficiency. But again, it's, you, 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 we, can't, we can't think about this being the same everywhere. It really depends on where are you and what are you producing. And so there's, there's the efficiency of the, uh, on the grower side but also the efficiency of the whole rest of the of the supply chain, as you were uh, mentioning, uh, Lise. Um, so what, you know, what? Uh, I, I think I'm going to actually bounce off what oh. you were saying about time scale. Mm -hmm. So are we talking about time? Are we talking about sustainable 2017? Are we talking about sustainable till 2020? Are we talking about sustainable for the foreseeable for the unforeseeable future? And those are different questions, and they have different answers, which is what Tim was just pointing out. And I think that that is, and I also thought this morning we heard about uh, people, the actions being driven by fear, sloth, and greed. I love that. I thought that was great. I think that another, a coupling of that is people have short attention spans. So a few years back when oil was expensive, the car companies were doing great with electrics, hybrids, Priuses, you couldn't keep them on the lot. What is it now? completely flipped around in just a few years. We don't, most of us, people as a whole, don't think far ahead. They think about instant gratification, short-term gratification. When we look at what people buy, there's a difference between aspirational buying and actual buying. When you survey people and say, would you pay a little bit more for something if it were greener? Yep, yeah, I'm on it, yep, got it. When it turns out it's a little more expensive, it's more difficult to get, you have to go out of your way a little bit to get it. There are certainly hardcore people that, well, yep, I'm, I'm there, I'm still doing it. There are other people saying, no, I just, I don't have time. I don't have time to do this. So I think that the question of sustainability in general is a hard one to pin down. We've, it's a great word and we all love to use it, but it's, it's over what time scale and exactly what do you have to do to get there? And I've been talking about people, but of course what people decide drives what business decides. So it's a, it's a I can't even think of a word, it's a complex situation, I guess I would call it a, a very tightly interlocked web, except we can't see all the strings. 
I, I'd like to um, maybe tell a story about sustainability since you mentioned oil. <clears throat> I once had a conversation with a water um, official from Libya before when the Gaddafi regime was still in place. And uh, there was um, something called the, the Great Underground River, I think was the term of it. Um, fossil water, which means water that was deposited many thousand years ago and is not being recharged, was to be extracted from the des under the desert, where there is groundwater in places, even fresh groundwater, and shipped up to the northern coast where um, it was more uh, attractive to do agriculture. And so we were having this conversation about mining fossil groundwater, and I said to the official, uh, that's not sustainable, you, you just can't keep doing that. And he said, well, we pump all the oil out, why shouldn't we pump the water out? So <laughs> there is a slight difference between oil and water, and it takes a lot longer <laughs> to regenerate the oil than it does the water. And the nice thing about nature is if we pump all the groundwater out, we pump it a higher, if we really want to extract much more groundwater, we're going to have to do it unsustainably in the sense that the water levels, the reservoir, the assets will decrease. That, that aspect of sustainability, I think, is pretty simple. There are issues about how long that will take, and if we do it for our lifetime, then it's okay, and if it's depleted too much later, it's not. But groundwater is a renewable resource. It just renews, and not always, but in most cases, it just is renewed very slowly. Not as slowly as oil, but slowly. So we have a nice feedback in nature. We saw it happen in the Ogallala Aquifer. If the groundwater level gets too low, it's just too expensive to pump it, especially for relatively cheap crops, such as we're growing in, in uh, non, uh, uh, such as we're growing in the Ogallala. So there's this interesting balance in sustainability. Um, something might become economically unsustainable before you actually deplete the resource. And it may be more sustainable to pump groundwater for wine grapes than for alfalfa, let's say. So uh, it is a complex concept in the sense that the economics get tied up. But there's no question that over-pumping uh, groundwater will have significant implications economically uh, in, in the longer term. And that we'll get that feedback. And at some point, we'll say, this is not worth Pumping. So maybe what we should be doing when we talk about water efficiency and so on is to do what maybe an engineer would call a bounding analysis and say, how much more groundwater could we, or how much more can we get out of our groundwater resource through, say, a, a wedge-based estimate of efficiency increase? And is that really where we want to increase our food production, by squeezing a little bit more out of groundwater? Or can, for example, we have a 5% decrease in food waste and our maybe a 5% decrease in our meat consumption. And that's actually much more efficient than trying to increase efficiency of water use from groundwater. I, it's, I don't know the answer and I do agree it's going to depend a lot on regional differences, but it's a very good topic to, to look at uh, from a strategic point of view because we can't afford to do everything and we, farmers who, for example, might want to, on two hectares, adopt drip irrigation with a real-time control system to figure out when and where to put it, precision agriculture, I don't think it's gonna happen for a lot of those two billion farmers. And there may be better ways to get more food production out of the resources we have. Those are the things maybe we should be looking more at. So I see we have about 45 minutes left for, for, the, for the panel, so it's maybe a good time to switch to uh, questions from, to, from the audience. So uh, based on, on what our speakers have been talking about, would anyone like to, to ask the first question? Great. Uh, so thank you to, to all the, the panelists. It's, it's great. And I, I'll actually start with a, a point Alexandre said, which was um, groundwater is hidden. And, um, and it's true that one of the big problems of groundwater is that we locally extract it. And we have few visibility of what happens because it's a distributed resource. And so this, this um, balance between local extraction, 
of a hidden resource that's shared and ill-priced, because it's hard to, to put a good pricing on this, makes it very hard to, to monitor. And so the, the, the question I had for, um, for all of you is, um, it's actually a two-false question. In, in developed countries where we do have a pretty much good monitoring of the aquifer, what type of, you compared Australia with uh, different regions within the High Plains aquifer, differences between Nebraska and um, Texas, for instance. Even there, the governance and the sharing of this groundwater is different. Uh, I, th I think Australia or Chile also have some, some systems themselves. How, wh what type of systems have you seen emerge and what does work, what doesn't work to deal with this problem? So that's when it works. And when there's no even a monitoring, when we're talking about whole regions of the world that use groundwater and they don't even know well how much of it they have, what can we do to help them? Okay, so your question is, is, is twofold. In developed countries where we are, we have, or we're supposed to have better monitoring of the groundwater resource, um, what types, what types of, of governance systems uh, or do- markets. Or markets, so either government or, or the market. This is America, after all. Um, work <laughs> or don't work. <laughs> and the second question is about developed country, developing countries where um, where, uh, where nothing is in place and, and uh, what we could do to, to, to help them. So maybe, uh, Lise, this is... Uh, uh, no? um, I actually am going to not talk much about the U.S. side at all because my other, the other panelists know more about the U.S. situation than I do. I will say in India, they have... This astonished me when I first found out. India has a wealth of groundwater data going back for a very long time. And it's not always pretty. And it's not always efficient, but just the fact that that database is there is huge. So you can find out, and, and you know, it doesn't mean that people and companies don't challenge it, but you find out that uh, in this particular district, they're qualified, you know, they're being labeled as being overexploited. And that means you're not gonna do anything more there. And again, there may be some back and forth, and I don't agree with you, and here's why I don't agree with you, and so on. But I think one of the things that can be done around the world is to build the database. And that's not a quick fix at all. Um, it takes a long, long time. But again, we're looking forward. So I would say, first of all, build the database. Build a way to manage uh, dispersion, I guess, of the data. Who knows what? And, and how accessible is that data? Um, again, going back to India, I will say that I don't know that I ever got a good handle on their regulation structure. It's very complex, but the people there certainly understand it. That's never going to be something that looks the same around the world. So again, this is going to, yet again, we all keep circling back to it's local. It's local. So ha build the database. Build a local understanding of how it, what it means and what the, what the concerns are right there. So I, I am constantly saying this on almost any topic. It's local. It's local. The control has to be local, too. Uh, I'd like to reinforce the feeling that water markets are a very good way to uh, encourage a efficient this was a joke. <laughs> use of water. Yeah. But um, in order to sell water to somebody else, you have to own it. So mm -hmm. there's this issue of property rights. And property rights are, um, in some parts of the world, like Ethiopia, there aren't even clear property rights on the land, let alone the water. But in many parts of the world, surface water, since it's better monitored and it's often delivered by the state, um, has property rights associated with it because the state allocates um, the water, at least if they have it. Um, there's a tentative allocation to farmers. Uh, groundwater is a lot different because there are very few places where people have rights to water. How do you take a distributed resource that doesn't coincide with actual land boundaries and say who gets what? Um, the state of New Mexico tends to do better on that. And so I would argue, although I don't know much about water markets in New Mexico, is potentially better than, say, the state of California, which historically has not allocated uh, rights to uh, groundwater. And in fact, 
Um, farmers in California, at least as of until recently, were quite private about re releasing data. Um, it's one thing to collect the data, it's another for the farmers to actually um, provide it. So that's one thing that may be changing in California because of the recent droughts is um, state-sponsored um, initiatives to assign rights to groundwater. But obviously that's really political, right? If you can pump all you want, why would you agree to, um, with the state on a limit to the amount that you, quote, own? Um, it brings up what's called the common pool problem that you all know about that is um, actually incentivizes overpumping and depletion if you don't have rights to water. Um, so it's, it's nice to think about people um, using water they don't own more efficiently, but frankly, there's no incentive for it. So I think the institutional aspects of this particular issue of um, trading groundwater, which could be perhaps quite beneficial, because unlike surface water, you don't have to move it around. It's, it's down there. It's just a matter of how much you pump from your well. Uh, in China, they're adopting a policy uh, where it's a little easier to affect institutional change from the top down, um, where um, farmers have uh, things like ATMs on their wells. They have a card, or, or more like, I guess, a, a phone card. You have a certain allocation on your card. You put it on the, uh, in the ATM, and if you've used up all your water, the pump doesn't go on. And, um, well, you can think about how feasible that would be in the US, but it is making a difference in China. So the whole issue of water rights and markets and groundwater, I think, is quite interesting. Because uh, talk about an open opportunity to um, make change. Uh, where, where there's very ill-defined property rights. I think that's a good example. And, and just to add that, it, and, and as we've heard, there's this huge diversity even in uh, state control of groundwater, government control of groundwater, even in the US. So California is, is just now beginning to wrestle with this around groundwater. You know, do you have to register a well? Does the well have to have a meter on it? Who gets the data from the meter? It, other places in the U.S. that already exists, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit about the you know it's it, it it might be easier if it would have been governed forward, but now we're trying to govern backwards, right? There's already a problem. The system, of course, has inertia, and then can you go into California and then institute a tight control over the extraction of groundwater? That's a, that's a really really tough one to do. Other places. Uh, I will move out of the Ogallala, but there's a lot of groundwater irrigation in the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, you have to sign up, you have to get a permit. There's basically a moratorium on drilling wells unless the state tells you you can, so fairly tight control. Uh, and then going back down to Texas, basically if it's your field and you want to put a well in it or if you want to go uh, not that far from Atlanta in Georgia, if it's your land and you own it and you want to put a well in, you just put a well in. So th I, I would argue that, it, that it, even in the U.S., it is uh, not, it's a resource that's not very well governed, and implementing a system to be able to govern it lacking an economic market, which the states that have done it, it is, it's not a market-based approach, it's a control. It is a, it's governance by the state. So North Dakota does it, Nebraska does it, Texas really doesn't, Oklahoma doesn't, places like that. So uh, it, huge discrepancies even within this country, let alone places, as was mentioned, where uh, if there's not even secure title to land, then you know, how are you gonna have secure access to water that's underneath that land. Hi, um, thanks so much for that um, insight. I just wanted to build on that question about um, governance, institutional um, control, and sort of throw it back to the panel. Um, we all know people who've been working locally, um, and I work for a watershed group, um, so the way we approach um, this nexus is to look at sub basin level concerns. And I wanted to 
bring the conversation back from India and China, knowing that the governance structure there and the regulatory framework is what it is. But moving forward in the US, um, if we do have EPA still um, functioning moving forward, I just wanted to see what the panel feels about institutional frameworks and bringing capacity to grassroots watershed groups, advocacy, organizational, and really giving the power to the people who actually want to take those kinds of approaches and um, where the real um, climate change, I'm assuming everybody believes in that here, but if those decisions have to be made now, um, how do we bring that to the fore? Thanks. I think one of the challenges is Nobody knows what everybody else is doing. So this is one of the challenges anywhere in the world, in the US as well as everywhere else, is here I am, I'm in this watershed. I know who else is here, but I really don't know how much water they use. And I don't want to tell anybody how much water I use. So there's just a lot of secrecy and, and sensitivity and almost paranoia. So until there's a good understanding of that, it's very difficult to figure out who should be at the table. And then once you figure out, so that's the first question, who needs to be at the table? And the second question after that is, okay, of the people, the entities sharing this water, who are they, how much do they need, when do they need it, and what quality do they need? Do they need pristine water? But before we can even get there, We've got to somehow overcome this, this, I'm not gonna tell you because you might say bad things about me or you might put limits on me. So I don't, that's something that is wrestled with really around the world, except in places where the government is extremely strict and says, no, you're gonna tell. But that's not common. And, and, go ahead. This, this idea of, of uh, basins and, and who is gonna govern it, there's, a, there's actually a contrast in the US because the control of the water resource for groundwater is almost entirely allocated to states. Surface water in the West is this mishmash of consortia of states, but some of it's federal. But then you have water quality concerns, which in some cases an, an agency like EPA actually does come in and forces individual states to work together. So in our neighborhood in the eastern US, the Chesapeake is probably the best example of that. So it's six or seven states, and if needed, the federal agency will come in and say there has to be coordinated action to fix this. But I don't know of anything like that around the management of groundwater in the US, even for aquifers that underlie multiple states, that they cross state boundaries. So that would actually be a new uh, kind of course of action for the management of aquifers in this country, but maybe the water quality uh, is, is uh, a pathway, the way that they do it on, for some of the quality concerns. John? Yeah, um, actually I wanted to comment on what you were saying earlier about <coughs> available data, how much do we really know about available water resources? There is a publication from the Aspen Institute that just came out, it's about the internet of water, right? How do we share the knowledge that we have across the entire you know, globe about you know, water availability and, uh, uh, and how do we better manage that resources. To me, you know, to answer your question earlier about should we really have grassroots you know, group of people that really manage the water resource and address the issue of water resources, to me that's very important because the best steward of water resources is gonna be the water user himself, right, or herself. So it's gonna be the farmer. And, um, you know, thinking about the farmer doesn't know the available water resource, I, I don't think that's the case, right? Because uh, they pump that water. They know what the cost associated with pumping. They know when their well is going dry. They know when they cannot finish the season. And that has the direct impact on their, you know, bottom line. And so the knowledge is there. How do we get all the knowledge and we really dissipate the type of information globally so that everybody really can take advantage of the bad experience that other folks had had? I can tell you that you know, the understanding of uh, water conservation, the understanding of water resources today is directly related to the cost of pumping. And so just to bring it back home here into the US, you will say that you know, if you are in the northern part of the Ogallala, 
probably the grower is not going to worry too much because he's pumping water from uh, you know 30, 40, 50 feet. But if you go down you know farther in uh, in Texas, the water now is being pumped from three, four, or five hundred feet. So the cost, and so those growers are a lot more in tune with water conservation practices and to the aquifer recharge because either they had to drop their well or they have not the ability to really you know, finish their season or you know, it's coming to a high cost. There are areas where they say, you know, hey, you don't really need this irrigation next week. I say, yeah, but it's cheap, right? It's insurance. I'm gonna turn on my water anyway because what's an extra $10? What's an extra $20? If it was a lot more than that, you will see that they will pay a lot more attention. Now, Groundwater district, I think, you know, have a lot of opportunities here to really influence how growers have access to water conservation. And often, groundwater district, you know, there is a huge representation from growers themselves. And so, I think, you know, this type of organization can really help standardize how we address the long-term issue of water conservation, and then at the same time, how do we build a bank of data that can really be spread out globally. Because while it's true, we need to address the local issue, there is a, a fundamental problem which is of global nature, which is lack of water. I, I'd just like to say another word or two about the Murray Darling uh, at the risk of over uh, <laughs> emphasizing that success. Um, the Murray Darling is a basin oriented um, management scheme. It's the name of a basin. It goes over, uh, I think three, maybe more than that, uh, Australian states who came together and agreed, as, as in Chesapeake. But this is water training, and the reason it works is because the farmers and the governments in the area, in a democracy, became convinced that it was in everybody's benefit, that everybody would do in the long term, or for that matter, each individual would do better in the long term. Because if I have a water right, and I'm not getting much out of my water, I make more by selling it to somebody who is getting a lot than greedily pumping it and still not making that much money. And um, one of the interesting things about the Murray Darling is there's a water right assigned to the environment. And so you say, well, who represents the environment? Well, it's a consortium of stakeholders, environmental groups. And they, since they have a right to a certain amount of water, they can choose to sell the environmental water to growers in a time of need maybe get a good price for the water so the stream flows a little lower, the wetlands suffer a bit, and but they have more money in the long term to do environmental restoration. And so the idea of the environment being a stakeholder in a water market I think is also very creative. So are there aspects of this surface water based water marketing scheme that could be applied in places like the US to groundwater? And uh, if we actually assign rights and monitor how much people use, um, I think it might be feasible. It, it might be a way forward in, in groundwater. Hi, my question has to do with the role of the legal system, the courts, um, lawsuits in maybe forcing better management of water systems. And in Minnesota recently, um, citizens sued the state over the depletion of the aquifer that feeds, is connected to um, White Bear Lake. And they won that lawsuit and it was quite a stunning rebuke for the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. And the court ordered um, a complete review of all permits and pumping from the lake, um, enforcement of water lawn restrictions in times of depletion and all of that. So I'm wondering if you know of other cases where the courts have intervened and actually forced um, better enforcement, uh, you know, forced lawmakers to create new policy or enforce the ones they have, and if you feel like that's a viable way or how connected that is to what you're talking about. So one of the examples in North America we have is the Edwards Aquifer, right, for example, in the that's the aquifer that covered the, the Austin, San Antonio, all the way to the, uh, uh, to the Rio Grande area, uh, where uh, you know, we had a, a deplete. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a unique aquifer because actually, while it depletes rapidly because of the large pump, pumping that is done from uh, agricultural as well as uh, urban use, but it also has a rate of recharge that is quite high. However, anytime the aquifer goes below to a certain level, you have a the, some of the natural springs stop flowing hence issues on the environment and endangered species and so on and so forth. So the Edwards Aquifer came through with regulation where say we will pump no more than two acre feet of water 
per acre of land, and then so the grower had to uh, obey basically to that particular regulation. <coughs> that created a situation, in my opinion, that was quite favorable to the introduction of technologies, right? So um, we have seen in that area people, uh, growers shifting from uh, a fur irrigated system to pivot irrigated system. Uh, a lot of introduction of new technologies such as drip irrigation, which is high efficiency. Uh, but again, you know, the unfortunate part is it's always reactive to a crisis. Or it's always react these type of these situations are always reactive to a particular uh, law or a, a lawsuit that, uh, you know, it creates a situation where growers are forced to introduce new technology. So that's been my experience, you know, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. I mean, while at the same time you want to get into a position, you don't want to get into a situation where you have these issues with lawsuits or uh, the government regulating access to water, uh, often these type of situations create an increase in technology and, in, and you know, a, a, uh, a awareness in the area. And so today, if you look at their area, you know, cr growers are still able to have uh, two crops per year uh, with high efficiency systems. And they're very sensitive, you know, to, you know, uh, what, uh, what uh, the pumping is on a yearly, year to year basis. And so I think they kind of took care of the long term vision uh, for water conservation and water sustainability. There's, there's certainly precedents for legal action on surface water. But again, that's a lot easier to monitor what's going on. So, you know, when you get the lawsuits at the Supreme Court that have two states, so Kansas versus Nebraska, it's because of the flow over a boundary. And that's just a lot, of, all you need to do is monitor the flow at the boundary and you can kind of tell what's going on upstream. Um, being able to do that for an aquifer would be uh, not impossible, but at least more difficult. But there's lots of precedence on the surface water side of both state boundaries within a country and also international boundaries. And so what, how long did it take for the legal framework to be developed for surface water? some time, right? For Still groundwater. developing. Still developing, and for, for groundwater, we're, we're almost at zero, even in, yeah. even in a, a state, a, a country as, as developed as, as the US. So. A question over there? <coughs> Shirley Coleman, Columbia University. Um, I'm really following up this last point, and I'm glad that you came into it, that uh, surface water is extremely measurable, groundwater isn't. Giovanni said earlier on about the lack of, lack of data across the world. Um, two well, questions. One is that would the panel agree with me that we need a replacement for the GRACE satellite that went down very, very quickly, uh, which was measuring groundwater across the world. And on the other side of it, we have the UN Convention on surface water, which is taking a grip. We have water sharing agreements across the world, but that's on surface water. Groundwater, we haven't even got the agreement of the basis of a convention as yet. And this whole area was left out of the Sustainable Development Goal 6 on water because nobody wanted to actually commit themselves to have to share the water with a neighboring country. So this is a a very difficult area, and perhaps the panel are understating, if you like, what knowledge there is, even in the United States, but certainly across the rest of the world. Yeah, certainly Jay Famigletti has done some really nice work with the GRACE data, uh, often illustrating California, because that's where he is. Uh, but that, yeah, I do, you're right. We're, we were remiss in not mentioning that data earlier. But to replace the satellite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, SMAP now is, sorry? SMAP now, I think, is, is going to do no, something. No, not really. Hmm? Not really. No. Different measure. <laughs> no. we, we've used a, a bit of the GRACE data, and um, it's very coarse resolution. Yeah. And uh, the irony is GRACE is very useful because it provides a data source where there is no other, but that also makes it difficult to check its validity. So sometimes, uh, for example, in China, we found that Grace said water levels were going up when in fact they were going down because we had you know, other data. So Grace as a global tool uh, has been great, not just in uh, groundwater, but also in, in other areas like ocean sea level change. But uh, I, and I, I'm certainly all for uh, another, maybe even better mission. It's a very uh, innovative technology, but um, in a lot of parts of the world, the pro we do have the measurements, they're just not publicly available. Yep. Uh, so, uh, 
the nice thing about GRACE is one country can unilaterally provide a data source, but it's hard to check that data source if you don't have any ground truth available. And in, in Morocco, the, the problem is similar because the area where they're pumping the groundwater is quite small compared to the resolution of, of, of GRACE. And when you look at the data, it tells you that over the past 50 years, it's been, the levels have been more or less stable, but in fact, they've dropped down significantly. Now they're, they're pumping at 400 meters. But the government does not want to release the data because they're afraid that if they do, then you know, their agricultural sector will just collapse. People will start buying their production, thinking, oh, you know, they're, <clears throat> they're going to be done in just a couple of years. They don't have any water anymore. So. I just want to come back to the point um, on the Edward Zakafer. Um, isn't that, isn't the Edward Zakafer kind of a, an example of <laughs> why you actually want local conflict resolution mechanisms to be able to resolve a problem? My understanding of the Edwards case is that it actually reinforced Texas's rule of capture and actually makes it more difficult for the groundwater management districts of Texas to implement control measures because that case reinforced the precedent of controlling groundwater as a taking by the government, which would mean that many of the, the mechanism in the state to enforce groundwater uh, abstraction is now hamstrung because these districts are afraid of implementing measures because they're afraid they're going to have to compensate users. So I just want to come back to the panel on this and ask, do you actually think that the court-based approach is the most effective way to kind of resolve these disputes? Or is there, you know, coming, coming back to some of the Ostrom stuff, more of a local dispute rec uh, mechanism resolution, is that, what's your take on kind of what's better? Because again, I, I think the Edwards case reinforces a really negative aspect of yep. something. I, I, I would agree. I mean, my, my preference personally would certainly be much more along the lines of what did they do in Australia to try to identify what, uh, at least maybe everybody is winning or neutral in the medium to longer term. In the short term, it might not be the case. But the idea that, uh, you know, the, the, what you descri described, Greg, with the Edwards case is that there's, there's a legal action, but that legal action is overlain, overlain on top of the way that they govern or don't govern water in Texas, right, which is also problematic. So the, the, the outcome is, you know, that's not that surprising an outcome given legal challenge and uh, the way that they govern that resource already. But, but certainly trying to develop solutions that recognize the kind of specificity and, and of location that involves multiple stakeholders I mean, that, as an optimist, that to me would always be the first choice. Um, and, and then legal action might be, you know, quite a ways down the list. And as I noted earlier, it's difficult because it's a, uh, we don't monitor this resource in the same way that we monitor surface water. I, I might add that another advantage of a, a market arrangement is it encourages innovation. Because if I have, using all my land and I have a right to a certain amount of water, and I can use half the water, then I can sell the other half. Right. So I have a financial yeah, I incentive for innovation. Whereas if I'm, something's imposed on me by a court case or central authority and doesn't give me the advantage to benefit from efficiency, then I probably won't try. Actually, that's what happened exactly in the Edwards area, right? Because uh, growers who actually found water conservation practice, they use only half or three-fourths of the allocation that they had for a particular crop, and then they found a financial benefit to sell the water to the city of San Antonio that was growing you know, on a huge rate. And so now your profit, the farm profit, is no longer about maximum yield, but is the overall budget that comes from selling the water and making a yield, making a crop. Right, but that case makes it more difficult in the rest of the state for the local governance institutions to, to, to put a cap and then allow that trade that reinforce the mechanism of the rule of capture, which you own all the land, all the water beneath your land, and you can pop as much as you want. Yep, you're right. Yep. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask a question a little less about the legal aspects and maybe more about technology. Um, we've talked about the groundwater resource as almost an emergency measure um, when there's periods of drought 
for cases like that. Um, but there are areas of the world where even the groundwater is being depleted or otherwise the aquifer is being like increased in salinity so that it can no longer be used. So in those cases where the groundwater is no longer an emergency resource, are there other alternatives to continue agricultural production when surface waters are diminished and groundwaters have become uh, saline? I can take a stab at that. <laughs> so, yes, there are options, right? I mean, and uh, it's, uh, it's drought tolerant crops. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're gonna have to, you know, in order for uh, to have profitable yield, you know, you're gonna have to have water. So, I mean, there is no doubt about it. Whether it's come from rainfall, whether it comes from aquifer, or comes from a combination of both. Now, to your point, when the combination of rainfall and groundwater resources or surface water resources is not enough to meet the evaporative demand of the crop, how do you go, you know, wh what do you do? And uh, there is an opportunity there for technology to really provide value to the farmers. You know, today, uh, you know, we have drought tolerant crops that we're trying to introduce through traditional breeding or through biotechnology. Uh, they really give an opportunity to farmers to have access to product that they can withstand, you know, long period of droughts. Um, you know, talking about uh, uh, alternative crops as well, right? Uh, you know, today, you know, not everybody needs to, go, to grow maize or corn, right? Uh, there is an opportunity for <coughs> sorghum, for millets, for other type of crops that use less water. Granted, there has to be a market for it. So today, everybody goes for the highest cash value crop. Uh, but if we think about, you know, in those areas where water availability might not be enough to make, uh, uh, you know, my uh, corn, then we can look at other opportunities. But for example, we look in, uh, um, let me give you my private, uh, the perspective from the private sector. You know, today we're introducing technology in, uh, um, in South Africa through the WIMA project. The WIMA project is a partnership between the Gates Foundation, Monsanto, and other companies where basically we're providing technology, biotechnology for free, providing, you know, uh, opportunity for uh, uh, drought-tolerant maize to be grown in those areas. So the opportunity is there. How do we introduce it fast enough? Of course, you know, anytime we have products that have biotechnology, there are also, um, you know, issues associated with the introduction of biotechnology in some countries where it's not accepted. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult balance, and, uh, you know, it's not just something that can be solved overnight, but the opportunity is there, in my opinion. And I think the industry, as well as, uh, you know, the, the, the yeah, universities through their breeding program are doing a fantastic job in trying to introduce that technology. I don't think we're doing it fast enough. You raise a serious question that we ought to be uh, honest about. In, there's no inherent reason why everybody who wants to grow food locally can do it with the resources available. There's an um, ecological concept of carrying capacity, which I think applies to agriculture too. And in the sort of semi-hypothetical case you mentioned, where there's not enough of either surface or groundwater, and the population's growing very fast. And by the way, they don't have enough money to buy expensive technology or even much any technology. Um, there's gonna be a real problem. And th that area is Sub-Saharan Africa. This is the primary area, but there are other parts of the world that are also have problems. But Sub-Saharan Africa is particularly vulnerable because of the population growth rate. And, uh, people working in this sector have to realize that there are, um, there's more than water security problems. There's larger political insecurity problems that, in, that result when technology in innovation isn't able to keep up with population growth and with depletion of scarce resources. I might add soil resources too, not just water. So um, there's a lot to be said for being proactive and understanding where these areas are. And what can be done about it? Well, the core problem is really poverty. Kuwait doesn't really have much of a water problem. I mean, we could argue about the details, but they have enough money that they can get water. And they can get other things that they don't have in their own country, like nutrients if they want to grow dates or something like that. But um, the... Uh, issue that you raise implicitly goes well beyond water and has to do a lot with the, the structure of the global system, trade and food aid. And um, it's great to have foundations and other charitable groups um, bring money into areas to increase yield 
in, say, focused target you know, demonstration areas. But we have to ask realistically if that's sustainable. It could be sustainable if those sources of aid were much larger than they are. But they have to keep up with the population growth, too. So there's a larger political problem that um, most of us don't, in this field, don't really deal with because it seems intractable. So I just want to try to be honest about your question. There are certainly cases where improved technology can probably help. But there are also cases um, where it might not. And we, we ought to try to identify those cases and be aware of, of them as particularly uh, vulnerable parts of the world. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question. What happens when industry has a technical solution, but they choose to not deploy it because of a lack of profitability? Um, there's a, for example, there's a very large oil service company. It shut down its um, water services uh, division, and they were doing great things like aquifer recharge, um, storing water during the winter when demand was very low for that water, but they shut down the division because it just wasn't making enough money, at least for them, because uh, they're a multi-billion dollar enterprise. That's the $64,000 question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, fortunately, I haven't seen a lot of those cases, to be honest with you. I mean, that, uh, you know, from the, from the money perspective, I mean, it's, uh, I can see where, you know, a company will decide to pull off of an area where it's not profitable. Um, I can tell you that for the most part, I see that uh, you know in the in the in the water industry, uh, there is an actually you know in a tremendous push to partner with uh, you know a production company such as Monsanto or uh, with other institutions that uh, you know can really push the technology and the value that the technology can bring from the standpoint of uh, sustaining water resources. So I haven't really had much of an experience globally to see that company had to pull out because there was not money to be made in water. Uh, now, with that being said, you know, uh, you will see that that's cyclical, right? Once again, if you are in a situation where we have drought or when we are in a situation when price of commodity is going to go up, then farmers and uh, water users are going to be willing to invest more money in any type of technology that will bring value from the standpoint of conserving water and improving yield. So we see that over and over again, but I think it's the nature of the market. Okay, so we have time for one last question. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. This is so rich. And I just want to thank Dennis for really acknowledging the sort of poverty implications of why this is, in fact, so difficult. And I just want to put one thing to something that, that you said earlier, which was that you're not, I think, taking sufficient account of the inequity in access to groundwater. So the Indus Basin, which is what I work on, Upstream, there is a sweet water reservoir which you can tap into and people do quite profitably. Obviously, there's an energy cost of pumping. But downstream, so federalism here becomes really important, which is that if the aquifer itself doesn't supplement surface water supplies, what exactly are you supposed to do, right? How do you buy out these people? Do they even have enough water? And so the iniquity aspect on availability of groundwater while tying people to irrigated agriculture and then yet not giving them, I mean, there's, there's no ability to tap into groundwater, right? So the spatial aspects and the federal political aspects also really matter. So I just want that acknowledgement that this is way more complex than the ability to make money. And just one thing, and anybody who can address it, but really to the issue of local control, because I understand how interesting and sexy and that sounds, because we care about local communities having control. It's a lot more problematic because there are majoritarian concerns. Again, if there are ethnic, provincial, linguistic sort of divisions in a country, and the majority just happens to control the institutions, well, who is it going to favor? And so it's going to run water governance in the same way, and we see that again and again. So trying to think a little more contextually about what would we actually do where giving local control to an upstream community didn't totally shaft you know, whoever was downstream but of another ethnicity. Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly ag agree. It, it's at what scale do you, is it appropriate to govern? And you know, d we we talked about a few examples in the U.S. that are e either surface or groundwater 
just crossing state boundaries within the country. And, and, and we have some precedents for how uh, surface water uh, access is governed in that way, but, uh, but many fewer <laughs> examples of how that's done from groundwater here or elsewhere. You, you also raise the point that we didn't talk about very much that surface and groundwater are not two different things. <laughs> right? They are linked, and the and kind of the strength of that linkage uh, it might vary depending on what basin you're in. But but it's it's you know unless you're pumping fossil water f from a desert, then it's it, we're talking about one source. But it, in many of the places I'm familiar with in the U.S., there they are linked to each other, and uh, eventually over extraction of groundwater influences surface flows. So th which complicates it even further, you know, but, but still we have to acknowledge that they're, they are connected to each other. And the um, second part of the question, would anyone like to add anything? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that will be our final word. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists again. Thank